Few contemporary writers have received as much acclaim as Ian McEwan, a Booker-winning novelist who is as popular with critics as he is with his vast number of readers. This film looks at his novel Saturday, which takes place on the day of the march against the Iraq War in 2003, told through the eyes of the brain surgeon Henry Perrone. He's been at the window several minutes when he's aware of some new element outside. He doesn't immediately understand what he sees, though he thinks he does. It's a meteor burning out in the London sky, traversing left to right, low on the horizon. Gentle thunder gathering in volume tells him everything. It's already 18 months since half the planet watched and watched again the unseen captives driven through the sky to the slaughter. Everyone agrees airliners look different in the sky these days. Predatory or doomed. I felt some responsibility to the present. After 9-11, I did no writing for six or nine months. I became, like a lot of people, a complete news junkie. And out of that, there grew a, a sense of wanting to really have a novel right in the center of all those anxieties and twitchy, neurotic feelings that the world had changed, but we didn't quite know how. And uh, that's what I wanted to begin to catch. I didn't immediately think that I'd set this within a day. I thought history would sort of help me write it. But after I'd got, I don't know, 20,000 words in, I began to see that it would be a, a very useful structure for me. And obviously, it's a route down which many writers have gone before. So, uh, yes, writing really, as, as often happens, writing tells you how to write this particular novel. A Saturday it could be called a state of the world novel. Do you think the state of the world changed after 9-11? I mean, time will tell. We might actually discover this was just a, a, a local eruption and actually there's a bigger story swelling behind it, which turns out to be, who knows, climate change. Or, you know, this is actually uh, a preoccupation of the early 21st century that is going nowhere. But certainly, I've always been interested in those ways in which you know, large-scale events and private lives interact. Shamelessly, he always enjoys the city from inside his car, where the air is filtered and hi-fi music confers pathos on the humblest details. He's heading a couple of blocks south in order to loop eastwards across Tottenham Court Road. Cleveland Street used to be known for garment sweatshops and prostitutes. Now it has Greek, Turkish and Italian restaurants the local sort that never get mentioned in the guides. This is the fair embodiment of an inner city byway, diverse, self-confident, obscure. And it's at this point that he remembers the source of his vague sense of shame and embarrassment, his readiness to be persuaded that the world has changed beyond recall, that harmless streets like this and the tolerant life they embody can be destroyed by the new enemy, well-organized, tentacular, full of hatred and focused zeal. How foolishly apocalyptic those apprehensions seem by daylight, when the self-evident fact of the streets and the people on them are their own justification, their own insurance. The world has not fundamentally changed. Talk of a hundred-year crisis is indulgence. There are always crises, and Islamic terrorism will settle into place alongside recent wars, climate change, the politics of international trade, land and fresh water shortages, hunger, poverty, and the rest. It does seem odd that you know we can compartmentalize our lives, that we can be deeply worried about the terrible mess of the occupation of Iraq, and at the same time, you know, having friends coming to dinner and having a wonderful time, and these things can be in separate boxes. So I was keen to see how happiness and anxiety might rub together. Unbox me here. Yeah, exactly. 9-11 was in some ways an extraordinary kind of impediment thrown over the path of the early 21st century novelist because here you are writing your books in your study somewhere and an absolute world-shattering event takes place with extraordinary political, moral, social implications across the world. Um, and McEwan's response to this, to sit down and write Saturday, is on the one hand, absolutely up to the minute in terms of response to what's happening in the world. But it's also quite an old-fashioned book, um, and by that I mean that it's an issue novel. 
in the way that perhaps some of his Victorian predecessors used to write issue novels. On a smaller scale, you know, focusing on a particular abuse or a particular piece of social legislation they thought was needed. Uh, and what McEwen here is taking the extremely ambitious step of trying to um, respond, not perhaps to comprehend, but simply respond to this cataclysmic world event. We've talked a bit about the Iraq situation. Did the fact that you were brought up in a military family give you a particular purchase on it? My father was, his background was Glasgow, working class. He was very much in the culture of the pub, the uh, sergeant's mess, and later the officer's mess. He was quite a disciplinarian. I mean, he was a regimental sergeant major, feared by the men, hated too. How close were you to your father and your mother? What influence might that have had on you as a writer? He found it hard to be openly affectionate. I think fathers never fare quite as well as mothers do in my fiction. My mother was very warm, close, intimate, slightly neurotic, worrying kind of person, tense, insomniac. At the age of eight or nine, I remember when my father was off on exercises, I always think, great, I can sleep in my mother's big bed. I mean, I'm sure Freudian would have a lot to say about that. I was very physically close to her, and being sent off to boarding school was a real wrench. I mean, I, I don't think I wept like a lot of boys did. I just sort of closed down for years, not till I was 16 or 17, started listening to music, reading poetry, thinking about girl, all those things. I seemed to wake up again. You were the first student of Zion Center to do Malcolm Bradbury's MA in creative writing at University East Anglia, so you'd already decided you wanted to be a writer. Going to UEA for a year was a fantastic stroke of luck for me. I was the only student. The course, the creative writing course, consisted of seeing Malcolm Bradbury or trying to see him. In the term that he was meant to be teaching me, I saw him maybe three occasions for maybe 20 minutes. It was usually in the pub, the maid's head. I'd give him a story, and he said, I like it a lot. Uh, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I think you're uh, writing a story about... Uh, a boy who uh, rapes his sister. And he would say, oh, fine, uh, when can I have it? And, uh, and that would be it. I mean, uh, there was no course. But he was the superstar professor. He was my readership. And it meant that I wrote with a purpose. I must have written, I don't know, 25 or 30 stories that year. I first met Ian McEwen around the New Review, which was edited by a very good friend of mine who died a few years ago, sadly, Ian Hamilton, a poet whose lifelong ambition was to run a literary review, and he did, precariously, with enormous uh, difficulty for funds, but with no difficulty in getting people to contribute to it. Uh, one of the contributors was Ian McEwen, Clive James contributed to it, I did, Russell Davis did, Julian Barnes did, as I remember, on and on it went. And Ian held court in the Pillars of Hercules in Greek Street in Soho, which became a sort of pub salon. Um, most evenings, except Sundays. Not that there's anything holy about Sundays, but people didn't seem to want to turn up in Soho on Sundays. And Ian emerged as rather shy to start with. He'd published these stories, in early ones in the New Review itself, which had eased instantly seized the attention of literary readers. They, some said they were per perverse, some said they were downright nasty. They were immensely original, which is hard to be. And they quickly gathered a constituency of like-minded readers who saw in McEwen one of the voices of a new generation. I did want something very bold and bright. I, I did feel rather oppressed reading um, contemporary writing in the sort of late 60s, early 70s in Britain. Uh, I thought in a, in a tiny way I, what I wanted was very bold colours. And I think I really did actually end up writing myself into a corner. I mean, but looking at those stories where we're talking about senses of violence, different sorts of violence, violence against... Uh, the morals of the time, violence against the person, violence against yourself. Even from the little you've talked about your childhood, was the sense of violence around you? In an army camp, is, there is violence in the air. These 
people are trying mm. to go to war. I mean, experience has got to come from somewhere. Yeah. Do you see it coming out of that? Well, the, the, there was all, everything that you described there, plus uh, a fantastic degree of repression, um, a, a very polite middle class, lower middle class world in which, however terrible things were, no one ever said, I'm unhappy. Normal life must always go on was the sort of uh, key to it all. So it was pretty held down, locked in. And I think that when I was writing in my uh, late teens, early 20s, I felt a fantastic liberation. I can say what I want at last. Yes, and it's rather like a shy person who uh, has you know, three glasses of wine at dinner and decides he wants to be bold like everyone else and goes too far. Ian McEwan's early work was startlingly macabre. McEwan saw his second novel, The Comfort of Strangers, as the darkest thing he'd ever written. When he finished it, he felt he might never write again. I just felt I was at the end of something. I just couldn't see there was any future for me. I was, gonna, I was writing myself into silence, I thought, with this fantastically destructive, bleak, uh, murderous story of, of um, one couple's sort of psychosexual dramas um, spilling out and destroying uh, this vulnerable English couple who seemed incapable of actually ever uh, defending themselves or defining themselves or understanding themselves in any way at all. Was shortlisted for the Booker Prize? Yeah. Yeah. And your reputation was very high and uh, people like you know, myself and our lot around New Review and all that. You, it was very high. And you, you really didn't think you'd written yourself out in fiction. Yeah. I thought there was a fantastic disjunction between all the things I thought about and talked about with friends and the things I wrote about. I felt as if I was only writing out of the sort of tiny corner of my mind. What is nice about this is that you've got an open vowel. And I worked with Michael Barclay on an oratorio. So for once, I was writing about something sort of outside myself. As well as writing his first libretto, McEwen also turned his hand to screenwriting. Yes, that's right. Plowman's Lunch is quite interesting in reference to Saturday because you're talking about a, a specific political moment post Falklands at the Tory party conference. Yeah. Thatcher is there. Very bold to shoot it there. Very, uh, sh um, uh, dare it. Wow. Both those things, the oratorio and writing the Plowman's Lunch, emboldened me. I'd got out of myself. I could start to do something which is actually central to the English novel, which is address society in some way. And this is late. I mean, I'd started writing in 1970. We're now in 1986. Sixteen years later, I finally thought, I can now start to write properly. McEwan's strengths as a writer, and they are very considerable, um, on basically, one, one goes back to the actual basic thing that writers does, which is the ability to write brilliant sentences. Uh, I can always remember reading one of the very, very early stories um, I think it's, the, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, one of these absolutely sort of ghastly black ones called pornography set in a sex shop. And they, they, he just describes you know, the punters turning over these dreadful magazines and they, the crowd, they, they stir like troubled dreamers. And I thought, that's a brilliant sentence. That's you know, that, that inspired me to start writing short stories, reading something like that. Looking at his more recent work, um, I think his great strength is something that most novelists these days shy away from, and that is an attempt to engage with the world and what's going on with it. Um, it's increasingly difficult for novels, novelists to do this because of the absolute complexity um, uh, of incomprehensibility of what's going on out there in, in real life, uh, and also the fact that we're all technolo or supposedly technologically in interconnected and all these kind of, of innovations. And I think, um, I think McEwen is making a very genuine effort to do what the novelists of a bygone age did and to try and make some kind of sense of this. A man who attempts to ease the miseries of failing minds by repairing brains is bound to respect the material world, its limits and what it can sustain, consciousness no less. The actual, not the magical, should be the challenge. Fiction is too humanly flawed, too sprawling, too hit and miss to inspire uncomplicated wonder at the magnificence of human ingenuity. Perhaps only music has such purity, and above all, he admires Bach. Henry Perrone adores music, uh, so that when he hears the Goldberg Variations, he knows there is genius. When he reads Anna Karenina, he thinks, 
Well, actually, anyone uh, with uh, a notebook and a certain degree of patience could have accumulated all that detail. And he could see that it's sort of impressive, but it doesn't really give him that breathless sense of, of um, the sheer inhuman, near inhuman quality of, of the perfection that he hears in uh, Bill Evans as well as, 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 as in Bath. Uh, so I wanted to just uh, play with this idea of um, stories and whether we need them. But to take it in a slightly different direction, if one's looking for other ways to arrive at the truth of the human condition, now you've read a lot of science and, and you know, but are they finding out things that are more worth knowing about? I mean, this is sacrilege, really. Mm. Isn't it? Uh, than what you find in Anna Karenina? I think we probably have not yet bettered uh, a device than the novel for looking at what it's like to be other people and you know, what it's like to be someone else. I think movies, for example, are fantastically crude in this respect. They can't give you consciousness. They can't give you life, live from the inside. Even, I have to say, poetry can never quite give you what it's like to be an individual moving through time over you know, a long period of time in a society. He was ready to be interviewed. We interviewed him in his house, which was sort of the setting for the novel, Saturday. And everything was elegant, careful, meticulous. And his replies were unexpected. They came out of an awful lot of thought, a hinterland of thought, which he was bringing to bear on this novel. And that they had that thing about him which he still carries, I think, the mixture of being tentative and at the same time extremely sure of himself, extremely sure of his ground, I should say. And I suppose what's really happening here is that uh, here is the counter-argument to everything in Henry's consciousness, that in fact uh, he might not be able to respond himself but there is something almost visceral in the beauty of the poem uh, that I'm suggesting uh, can sharpen one's appetite for, for a fully lived conscious existence. So if you think of novels as sort of like minestrone soups, um, you know, late on I wanted to add another ingredient, um, another herb. Uh, uh, whose taste is really uh, making the case for literature, if you like, <laughs> against all the weight of, of, of Henry's uh, very sensible dismissal of it. One of the strands in Saturday is that it's about consciousness and, uh, in a sense, how matter becomes conscious. And Perrone, a doctor, after all, and a, very <clears throat> a man who's dealing in the brain in a practical way and also in an intellectual way, uh, he's convinced that our behavior is determined by chemical events and codes in the brain, and at one one day, all these mechanisms will be revealed to us. Uh, do you think that will happen? I think they will be revealed to us, but I, I'm not sure what, you know, to come back to an earlier point in the discussion, I'm not sure quite then uh, what we will know that we don't already know about how to behave and how to live. It might not tell us much. You could you know, crack the neural code, but will it tell you how to behave? Um, and my suspicion is uh, that, that it might well not. Uh, but he has a kind of faith, uh, it, and it's the only faith he has, he says, um, that in the material view of life, in, in the f philosophically material view of life, uh, there is a beauty and a grandeur, uh, that it doesn't diminish the world to, to think that um, it can be explained all in material terms. In fact, um, you know, it is wondrous and extraordinary, uh, just as much as if you saw it, um, life as being a, a certain kind of vitalist spark. Um, so uh, I, I at least want to give him my sense, uh, and it is one I share with him, of um, the material view being um, rich, warm, human, um, not 